what a pleasure it always is for me to talk with a man that v Sin has labeled the Michael Jordan of sports gambling. And listen, I'm predicting he's going to go right to the top of the charts as a best-selling author, Gambler, Secrets from a Life at Risk. And I want to tell all of you, it is one of the best reads that I've ever had. You know, normally everybody who knows me say, Brian, you're watching tape, you're watching games. I said, I'm reading Billy's book. <laughs> Billy, what a, what a great job. I mean, there are so many personal stories in there I loved. And, of course, I think you made me a better gambler. Well, I hope so. <laughs> uh, that was, uh, you know, the book is an autobiography of my life. But it's really a recipe about sports betting, sports gambling, handicapping. Uh, that is uh, a big portion of the book. And, uh, you know, I love gamblers. I love sports bettors. I'm not getting any younger. And I wanted to share that uh, with, uh, with my fellow people who love sports. You know, I want everybody to know that uh, Billy Walters is a man who did not – grow up with the golden spoon. My grandmother raised me. I could have had four parents, and I couldn't have had a better role model. And it was real simple with her. I mean, she, uh, uh, your word was your bond. Uh, you were polite. And uh, if you made a commitment, uh, you kept it. And, of course, the first sport that you become an expert at is shooting pool, okay? And if you're going to shoot pool, you're going to learn how to gamble at a young age. You're going to learn a lot of things about life, uh, shooting pool or being in a pool room. Uh, and uh, I lived in a small rural town in, in central Kentucky, and uh, there were no daycares. We couldn't afford one anyway. But my uncle, I had, a, I had a great daycare. He had a pool room in the town, and my grandmother would drop me off there, and uh, he'd take me to the back pool table and put up a couple of wooden Coca-Cola cases and give me a pool cue, and he'd go back to running his business. I started shooting penny nine ball when I was six years old. I'm rocking balls in my uncle's pool room while I'm in the first grade. And... Uh, the things that uh, that helped me later on in my life, I initially learned those things in the pool room. I remember the 1955 World Series. Mm. I was just becoming a baseball fan. <laughs> Tell us about the first bet you ever made, Billy. About 125 bucks on the New York Yankees to beat the Brooklyn Dodgers. It, it was money that I'd actually saved up for a couple of years with uh, – mowing grass on a paper route, and it was all the money that I had. And back in those days, I mean, Mickey Mantle and the New York Yankees and Whitey Ford, I mean, Yogi Berra, I mean, it was, it was, uh, they were my idols, and I didn't think, you know, anyone could beat the Yankees. On top of that, uh, you know, the Yankees had beaten the Dodgers regularly, and uh, so I had a town grocer, and he was a big Dodger fan, and uh, I bet him, I hope, I bet him 125 bucks that the uh, Yankees would beat the Dodgers, and uh, I was just sure, you know, it, to me, at that time, it was a sure winner. Well, it was a sure winner until it wasn't a sure winner, and, uh, and I lost my 125 bucks. And then you rose from there. I, another thing that people, I think, don't realize that I think served you very well, and that's a used car salesman, okay? Mm -hmm. I've always thought that salesmen, when they studied sales, they could work their way through the world, that they, they learned certain things about people. And a couple of areas where, where you and I... Uh, are different. Number one, I could never, never stand to bet $20 million in sporting events in a weekend. I'd be so scared. Um, how, how does it, because one of the things that made you so good in golf matches, pool rooms, shootouts, betting sports, the money doesn't seem to matter. How did that develop in your life, Billy? I really can't answer that. I mean, early on in my uh, as a, as a gambler and a better, I'm not sure it always served me well because. Uh, but I, I they're just uh, since I as far back as I can remember, I, I I've never had any fear about getting broke. I, I've got I've never had any fear because I, I guess maybe I've had such a, my, I've had such a high confidence level that I would be successful. I never had any fear. And I tell you, I think it's kind of difficult to gamble if you've got fear of losing. Matter of fact, I think it's almost impossible. Now, whatever the amount of money is that you feel like you can afford or you want to risk gambling, uh, I, I think you probably should stick to that. Uh, from my perspective, I, I can't answer it, but I was just kind of, you know, I guess I was kind of early on an evil Knievel of, uh, of gamblers. I had no fear factor, and uh, early on in my career, 
you know, I got broke so many times. Uh, I mean, a, at least a hundred times, and uh, the uh, but but it did serve me well uh, because later on, as I as I became uh, a successful gambler, I was never afraid to win. And you know, gamblers sometimes uh, some people are afraid to win, and some people obviously are too conservative. So I, I think you know if. You see, you see it happen all the time with people. They'll they'll get in a situation where they got an opportunity to win a lot of money, but they'll win a small amount of money and they quit. Once I got to the point I could win, my background in regards to not being concerned about losing, I think that served me well. You were in a golf match once, in which, as I recall from the book Gambler, your opponent needed to shoot a nine, just a nine on a par five, eighteenth, and he was the winner. And he wanted a buyout before he teed off on the 18th. And you said, get up there and hit the ball. Mm. I mean, Billy, that's unbelievable confidence when your opponent just needs a nine. But you thought, no, the pressure is going to set in here. Playing golf for, uh, for nothing is one thing. But if you haven't had that experience, and especially if you're a new golfer, and you get out and you play for a lot of money, uh, then it's going to bring uh, an added level of pressure that uh, it's uh, in, it, 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 it has an enormous impact. You see it. You see it on the PGA Tour. You, you know, it's not as noticeable, but there's a certain players on the PGA Tour that you know. You see how they perform on Sunday versus how they perform on on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They just can't quite get to the finish line. And you'll see guys that once they get a lead, you you know, you're pretty confident they're going to hold on to it. So gambling's the same way. In the book of The Gambler, uh, one of the most controversial chapters, at least I found it, was about the golfer Phil Mickelson. So we all knew in Las Vegas that Phil Mickelson loved to bet, and he made a huge bet, he told me once, on the Baltimore Ravens to, to win the Super Bowl prior to the start of the season. He cashed a big ticket on it, and I knew some bookmakers around Vegas that book big bets. But Billy... You actually go into business with Phil. I mean, you, you actually become partners. Tell, tell us how this unfolded and tell us about the story about Phil's actual, he admits it, addiction to sports gambling. Well, I met Phil originally at Pebble Beach. I was playing in the AT&T in a pro-am and uh, met him initially in 2006. Uh, ran into him again uh, in the Wachovia uh, championship in 2008. I was playing in a program, and we just we decided to uh, form a betting partnership. And uh, friend I, Phil and I were friends for eight years. Uh, we had a betting partnership for five years, and uh, and it was real simple. Phil uh, uh, had sports betting accounts uh, that I didn't have. They were offshore accounts. He could bet extremely large amounts of money, and uh, even with us partnering up as partners. I was able to bet more money uh, than I could have on my own. So it was a simple business relationship. Uh, and over the years, we became friends. Uh, at least I felt like we were friends. Uh, we played golf, and uh, uh, there were a number of things that uh, over the years we did together. One point, <clears throat> though, about, about Phil called you once and wanted you to make a very significant bet on it golf match that he was actually playing in. Tell us about that, Billy. Well, one of the things that I've noticed in, in, in uh, the time that I was associated with Phil is in certain areas he was uh, very naive, and, and he, he was, I guess, kind of easily excitable. But he called me up, and he was playing in the Ryder Cup at Madonna, and he wanted to bet $400,000 on the U.S. team. Uh, I thought, thought to myself, I said, well, you know, he, he's, he's had to lose his mind. I said, are you lost your – I used some uh, uh, <clears throat> I used some interesting words, but I said, if you lost your mind, I said, you know, you're viewed to be a modern-day Arnold Palmer. I said, don't you know what happened to Pete Rose? And uh, I said, there's no way in the world that, that I'm going to do this. And uh, he said, oh, okay, okay, and then that was it. He never made the bet. Uh, he did try to make the bet. Uh, and hopefully uh, he came to his senses after we spoke, and uh, he never made the bet. Uh, but in the entire relationship I had with Phil, he never bet on any kind of a golf match. Uh, he bet on a lot of other sports, 
But he never bet on any golf matches other than – and the time on the Ryder Cup, he wanted to bet $400,000 on the U.S. team that he was playing on. And uh, But hopefully after our conversation, he came to his senses and, and didn't do it. But we, there's no question we had the conversation. Uh, it, uh, and I was surprised. Yeah, and, uh, and also you detail that you think he bet – about a billion dollars and lost about a hundred million. Do I remember that correctly? Uh, well, I, I know I know what he did. You know that we did together, and he did with us. We have a detailed accounting system, and of every bet that we make, we win, lose, whatever, because we have responsibility for our taxes. Uh, later on, I, I I met two other uh, people who had started doing business with him in 1995, and they brought forth some detailed records. And to answer your question, a combination of what the records they had beginning in 95 and the records that we had, uh, that's those numbers are correct. Interesting. It is Billy, and, and I, I agree with him, that had Phil Mickelson agreed to come to trial and testify on Billy's behalf on the insider trading charge that wound up putting – Billy in a federal prison down in Florida that he would not have had to serve any time. Back with Billy after this. Welcome back, everybody. What a pleasure it is to talk to Billy Walters at any time about anything. But I have to tell you, I want to recommend it again. It's just about a, it's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful read, Gambler, Secrets from a Life at Risk. And believe me, even if you're not a sports fan, you're, you're going to enjoy the stories. And the next one, you're really going to enjoy, okay? Had Phil Mickelson agreed to come to trial and testify on Billy's behalf on the insider trading charge. It is Billy, and, and I, I agree with him, that he would not have had to serve any time. No one will ever know. There's no way you could ever know for sure, me, you, or anyone else, if he'd have testified whether I would have been found guilty or not. Okay? It's not a certainty. But I'm convinced, I'm, a, I'm, I'm as 100% sure that I, I don't think I would have been convicted. But the part I wrote in the book was real simple. It was nothing more, nothing less than to set the record straight. The only thing I put in there was what I had to put in there to straighten out uh, what's been misconveyed out there in regards, number one, to our relationship, and number two, uh, what his role was in this so-called insider trading case. The stock that Phil Mickelson bought, he bought in July of that year. The company reported earnings two months before that and indicated they were going to spin off this publicly traded company. Two years before that, they had looked at spinning off this publicly traded company. Okay, he bought the stock in July. and August, they came back out and reconfirmed what they'd said in the previous earnings call. He sold his stock. <clears throat> I didn't sell a share of my stock. I bought more stock and paid $4.5 a half more a share for it. Uh, and then what happened, uh, Phil, had got, he gotten involved in legal issues that had nothing to do with me. Uh, he was involved in a money laundering investigation with two other men. And uh, about a year later, uh, the question comes up about the Dean Food stock, uh, the investigation into the insider trading, a stock that I'd owned for 10 years. And uh, Phil had bought some of the stock and sold some of the stock and made a profit. And uh, the SEC, uh, when they were doing their investigation, asked to interview Phil. And he took the Fifth Amendment. He wouldn't answer any questions. And when I learned he wouldn't answer any questions, I asked him why. And he said, well, he couldn't answer any questions because uh, the people who were advising him as attorneys were afraid they would ask him some questions about the other case. Uh, and I said, well, look, this is an SEC investigation. This got nothing to do with your money laundering investigation. He just answered the questions, and uh, he wouldn't do it. Phil ends up uh, paying the Southern District of New York. Uh, he gave the money back he made in the insider trading transaction. 
And uh, as a result, newspaper accounts came out. Bill Mickelson, one of the most famous men in the world, gave back almost a million dollars in a, in a stock trade. And it made me look guilty as hell because if you're a person, you're looking at this, and there's a money laundering investigation that involves two people. One guy gives a million dollars back. Okay, to me, in my mind, he's either an innocent victim and he gave the money back, or he's guilty and he bought his way out. But regardless, it makes the other guy look guilty as hell, and that was me. As I go through this, I eventually got indicted, and uh, so I'm going to the Southern District in New York to defend myself. And I knew every fact of the case before I went to New York. If you know, if I if felt like I was guilty, I would have plea bargained, paid a fine, got a reduced sentence, and uh, saved a lot of money. But I was totally convinced there was no way I was going to be convicted because I knew all the facts. So uh, Phil told me that he'd been interviewed by the FBI on two occasions, and he told me, he said, I told on, on both occasions uh, I did not give him any inside information. He emphatically told him I did not on two occasions. So uh, I go to a trial in the Southern District in New York. Well, all over the papers in New York before I go there, you know, there's speculation about Phil Mickelson's going to testify on the trial, and uh, people are excited about that. And then when we did the jury selection, even if some of the prospective jurors asked if Phil Mickelson was going to be there. So everybody was expecting Phil Mickelson to be there and testify one way or the other, right? I thought he was going to come and testify because we, he told us he would. All I wanted him to do was tell that jury the same thing he told the FBI. So we go to court, and in the 11th hour, uh, Phil's lawyer says he's not going to come and testify. He's going to take the Fifth Amendment if you do, if you call him. Well, you cannot call someone to testify if they tell you they're going to take the Fifth Amendment. We reached out uh, through a mutual friend and asked him, well, will we at least issue a public statement? Yeah, I'll do that. Of course, he never did that either. Well, uh, as a result, uh, he never testified. So the jury never saw or heard from Phil Mickelson. Uh, mistake I made in the trial is I didn't testify you myself. You didn't testify yourself, right. And, but Phil never came forward, and uh, that jury went out, and uh, that was one of the things that uh, they didn't take into consideration when they came to their verdict. So Phil issues a public statement, distanced himself from me, uh, says he's going to be a lot more careful about whom he associates with. At the same time, he's gone into partnerships with another fellow who's a convicted felon, and uh, they started these golf matches called The Match. So hypocrisy is, uh, I mean, uh, I, I don't, you know. So I go to prison, <clears throat> and while I'm in prison, my daughter commits suicide. So, uh, no, I'll, I'll never forgive Phil Mickelson. One of the chapters that I really enjoyed was uh, how, how Billy Walters spent his time in, in the federal prison in Pensacola. It, you're going to be fascinated with the characters he meets. Uh, but then, Billy, you came out, and I, I was struck by your conclusion, because I, I really believe this, that we need to give people who are incarcerated reason for hope. Now, you had innumerable visitors. Uh, you might have broken a record for visitors at that at that prison, uh, your wife was always there when she could be, and uh, I, I, I chuckled when when you would have her buy the the good food out of that vending machine, <laughs> and you would yell at her to buy. I uh, I, I really loved that. Uh, but anyway, I, I I really recommend this book. I I could never put as much at risk as as you did, and of course the book Gambler. Also, Billy gives information to the average Joe, like me, okay, about how to, <laughs> how to win a little bit more at gambling. Billy, uh, bookmakers, they uh, change variables like they would go three or three and a half, but sometimes they go minus 110 to minus 120. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, which of those moves offers more value? Uh, for a sports gambler. Well, I put the charts in the books that show you the exact value of each number, mm -hmm. and it shows you the exact value of each half point. So luckily, uh, and I feel good about this, I think the majority of the people who are betting sports, they're now going to know exactly what each half point's worth. Some are worth more, some are worth less. They're going to know exactly how you know, money lines compare to point spreads. But as I put in the book, uh, each 
each 10 cent move is around a quarter of a point. So I'll give you an example. If they move it from three minus 10 to three minus 20, that's like three and a quarter points. So if you can take three and a half, three and a half is better than three and a quarter. I do want you to make the point for the young gamblers. Well, I'm not so young. <laughs> you got to talk me out of teasers, okay? Yeah. Uh, I'm a loser overall. I can't resist taking six points on two teams and moving sure. it. Um, but you make the point that parlays and teasers are a loser's game, okay? And and I want you to I want you to tell, especially our young betters who are out there, uh, why the risk is not worth it. Well, that's the reason they're called teasers. I mean, uh, look, taking six extra points is certainly appealing to anyone, and, and betting a smaller amount of money and winning a larger amount of money is also very appealing. Bottom line is, though, the uh, from a value standpoint, uh, a lot of people compare parlays and teasers to a straight bet. They think they're laying the same odds as they're laying on a straight 11 and 10 bet. Well, they're not. Uh, I mean, according to the rules of places, but like six-point teasers – the way they're set up now, uh, the, at a minimum, you're probably laying a dollar twenty-two, dollar twenty-three to a dollar. Sometimes as high as a dollar thirty to a dollar. Same thing goes with parlays. So, uh, from a value standpoint, you've uh, you, you've got a tough road to hoe. And uh, so, uh, lay eleven to ten is tough enough. You know, you're going to get about ninety-five point four percent of your money back laying eleven to ten if you bet on fifty percent winners. So when you, when you instead of laying eleven to ten, if you're laying six to five or six and a half to five, you can just imagine how that's going to work on you. So it's fun, uh, it's <laughs> exhilarating, and when you hit them, man, there's nothing like it. But uh, over a long period of time, it's uh, it's yeah, you, you're going to lose your money. <laughs> Jimmy vaccaro has been preaching that to me for years, <laughs> and I just I I can't resist. Anyway, I want to read to you just a couple of sentences. The truth is, until I decided to write this book, I would not have taken $20 million to share the details of my system. Friends ask me why I'd want to give away my secrets now, and the simple answer is I'm not getting any younger, and I want to give something back to sports fans. We're going to talk about some of the secrets that Billy Walters reveals in his book, Gambler. So we go to some of Billy's basics, and I'm going to start with him right now because everything, Billy, you wrote begins and ends with identifying value. Well, there's really nothing more, nothing less if you're betting sports and you're betting sports seriously. Uh, it's all about value. If you, can't, if you can't identify value, then, you know, if you're betting to make some money, you shouldn't bet. So if you see a game, and let's say you're a fan of the Chicago Bears, mm. And let's say that the Bears are a six-point underdog to the Green Bay Packers. Mm -hmm. But you say, no, wait a minute. I'm better than that. My team, you don't really have value yet, right? No, zero. I got no value. And frankly, uh, you know, I'll, I'll share a little funny kind of story with you. Uh, my wife and I are both from Kentucky. And uh, we're both dying of heart Kentucky Wildcat fans. Uh, but there's been many occasions when Kentucky's playing someone and and I'm betting on the other team, and she's pulling for Kentucky. So, no, to answer your question, when I when I bet on sports, uh, I don't have any favorite teams. It's whoever, whatever, whatever that team has, I bet on that on that day. That's the, that's my team for the day. And you advise anybody betting to shop for the best number. You've got to shop for the best number. If you don't, I mean, betting strategy to the average better is as important or more important than handicapping. You know, you've got to shop around. You, you've, if you can't, you cannot take bad prices betting sports, in my opinion, and win. Uh, you just can't do it. And there's a huge uh, discrepancy. You do shop around, and uh, so, but you must learn how to take, you know, good prices. That's the reason I devoted uh, a substantial amount of time and and, and the masterclass chapters on betting strategy. Uh, I think some people maybe only have one or two sources, and that's. It's next to impossible to win if, if you're not able to shop around and get the best price. 
Billy, when a period when you were the most successful <clears throat> is when you had the computer group and deep into analyzing with computers and numbers and things like that. And then you would measure what your group had brought out against the bookmaker's line, correct? And if you saw any value in a big difference, then you would make a move. Yeah, well, Brent, you're, you're right. Originally, I began with a computer group, and uh, that is exactly the way that it worked. Uh, in the mid-'80s, I, I realized that uh, the advantage was uh, it, it was getting smaller, and, and I also realized what I probably needed to do, and I did, is, is I got involved with a number of other uh, handicappers. And, uh, and so in order to, to stay ahead of the game for as long as I did, you know, there, there's continual change with sports as is a result with anything. And you've got to find angles and you've got to stay ahead of the game, so to speak. But, yeah, it's it very simply what I do is uh, I handicap a game, I make a number, and I bet my opinion against the, uh, the bookmaker's opinion. And uh, that's, that's really all it is, nothing more, nothing less. I think it's so important for people listening to you now and those who are reading your book – to understand that you should make your own numbers. Let's just talk about the National Football League because that's the most bet upon sport in, right. in the country. But people should make their own numbers. They should have their own power ratings. That's that comes through loud and clearly in in, in the book. Well, it's according to what you know how you want to approach sports. If you want to get really serious about it and you want to become the best you can become, yes, you must make your own numbers. Uh, I put a recipe in here in the book, uh, regardless of what level you bet. But if you don't make numbers, I've got a betting strategy in there. I've got I've got tables in there you can follow that'll make you a much better better. You'll have a much greater chance of winning. But if you want to go to the next level, you're in that level. You want to go to the next level. Every everything that I know about handicapping, about betting, a hundred percent of that's in that book. So if you want to make numbers, I, I've explained to you exactly in there the things that you need to do in order to be to build your own handicapping system. Now, bookmakers don't like losing money. And so if somebody like Billy Walters continues to win or continues to win, they cut down your limit or they say, no, I'm not going to take any action from you. So you had to use so-called beards or runners to make bets. And you made, surprisingly, I, I didn't realize, you made bets all over the world because in Europe, Sports betting has been part of the culture a lot longer than it has been here in the United States and Australia and Panama, and uh, that enabled you to make larger bets. Correct? True. I made a lot. I made a lot larger number of volume of bets, which uh, you know, which meant I bet a lot more money total. Uh, but book back to bookmakers. Uh, I've worked with a lot of bookmakers in my life that. It was just the opposite of that. They wanted me to bet them first, and they wanted to know they wanted to deal, do business with me directly, and because they wanted to take that information and move their line accordingly. And those bookmakers were very successful, very profitable, made a lot of money, and uh, and I had a good working relationship with them. They knew I was going to win, but what they would do, they would take my bet, and instead of moving their line a half a point, they would move it a point, or they made sure they stayed ahead of the of, of what. It, of the other market. Bookmakers, uh, most people that really understand bookmaking, they understand that you're going to have all different types of players. And, uh, it, and, and, the, and the really good ones, they know how to take information and they know how to make that work for them. Some that didn't understand it that way, uh, they would say, no, we don't want your business. But what would happen is... They would get bet by four or five different people uh, that were betting on my games. They had no idea they were my games. Instead of getting one bet, they got five bets, and their lives was still what it was uh, uh, before they took the bet. So you tell me who's better off, the bookmaker that wants to bury his head in the sand that says, I don't only want to do business with people or give me, you know, or I want to be, I, I'm going to be open to everyone, and yes, some guy may bet me he's a smart guy, but I'm going to take that information, I'm going to utilize it, and I'm going to take that and earn money in my business. I, I must point out the detailed 
about uh, how to become a better better in this book, Gambler, is believe it or not, Billy and the people who work with him, they put a point value on every player on every team. Now, as Billy points out, that, that sounds a little more complex than it really is because so many players in the NFL, you just give zero value to, you know, maybe it's backup right guard or, or whatever. But there were about 600 players who make a difference. I was really struck by that, Billy, is the thoroughness of assessing a weight on every player in the NFL. I mean, that, that, that really struck me. Yeah. Well, obviously, some players are, a lot, are more important. Quarterbacks. To, yeah, well, quarterbacks being the most important. But you've got some impact players, too. You, you've got the T.J. Mm-hmm. Watts of the world. You've got the George Kittles. I mean, and uh, everyone plays a role. And uh, But, again, as you know, once football season starts uh, into the second week, uh, everyone's playing with some kind of an injury, some some worse than others. And, and many on many occasions, uh, you know, you've got a player who's playing, and he's definitely going to be impacted. So the value of that player, uh, you got to have some idea what he's worth to the team. So he's out. Uh, okay, what's his backup worth? What's the difference? Okay, are you going to adjust your power rating? If he's injured, though, and he's playing, okay, how much are you going to downgrade his value? And then in a situation, I gave an example in the book uh, when Tampa played uh, the Rams, mm-hmm. when, when Tristan Worth was out, and, and how that was a, situ- a, situ- a one-off situation where he was much more valuable than he would normally have been. But, yeah, we, we have a, a player value. And, and that, but that changes continually. If you're going to bet a favorite, go early. If you're going to bet an underdog, bet late in the week. Tell us why that is. Well, that's a rule of thumb. Normally, the public bets on favorites. And, uh, and uh, you know, if, if you're going to bet on favorites, you need to get out of the way early. And normally, if you're going to bet an underdog, you, you wait till as late as you can take the other side. Uh, that's, that's a rule of thumb. Now, there are exceptions to that. Uh, an exception would be if, you know, uh, someone else was, you know, that you felt like was going to bet on the other side. But also, more importantly, if, if, there, if, if it involved a key number. So, uh, but yes, the rule of thumb would be to bet on favorites early and dogs late. You watch the games you bet on. I can watch four at a time, and I, I can do that, and I can process four at a time. We have, as part of our team, someone who watches every game, who grades every play. And, uh, and again, as you know, being a broadcaster, um, you know, sometimes plays are misleading. You know, sometimes Absolutely. a guy got lucky. Exactly. Uh, and you look at that box score, it's kind of misleading. If you're going to be serious about, really serious about doing this, I think it's a really good idea to watch the teams, uh, as many teams as you can play. We always talk with you about lines before the game and betting early in the week. And like, do you bet in game? Did you ever? Did you ever do that? Yes, uh, I've bet half times, obviously, my entire career. Uh, but in game bets, yeah, we do. Uh, we did make in in game bets, and again, there are times there can be value because a lot of times with these in game bets. The algorithm, the people are booking these, they, they input how they stand on the game. And when they input that, sometimes it creates an opportunity, you know. But end game, bet's a brand new bet. You know, you got to understand, every bet's a new bet, and it's got to be evaluated and treated as a new bet. I bet on so many teams in my life and bet on the opposite side and ha- at half, it's uh, unbelievable. We're continuing our conversation with Billy Walters, the author of a best-selling book, Gambler, Secrets from a Life at Risk. And when you think about Billy and sports gambling, and you think about where it was decades ago, when you basically had to travel to Las Vegas or Reno or someplace in Nevada to make a bet, and now, Billy, it, it's a part of the national psyche. I mean, you can bet almost anywhere. There's only a handful of states that haven't legalized it yet. And uh, my goodness, how times have changed when the feds were seemed like they were coming after you every year. Well, they were. And uh, I mean, essentially what's happened, Brent, is really uh, it's been been my dream. And to see it actually happen and, and take place, uh, it makes me very happy. But back to your, your, your point, 
When I first moved to Las Vegas in 1982, and I organized a group of sports bettors, uh, and I had about 30 runners on the street, and uh, we had an office. We have a, we had a business license. It was called Sierra Sports. Uh, up until that point in time, law enforcement, the only people they saw were organized were bookmakers, and some of them were involved with organized crime, not all, but some. And uh, so I, we were initially unfairly judged when we got here. We, we were thought that, you know, we just must be organized bookmakers and involved in the same thing. And uh, so, yes, I ended up with four indictments, and each and every time I had to defend myself and prove that I was a better. It cost me millions and millions of dollars. Uh, but uh, that's to see where we're at today. With legalized sports betting in the majority of the United States, you can do it from your cell phone, the comfort of your home. You're no longer looked at, uh, cross-sided as a potential criminal. Uh, it's uh, it's very fulfilling to me. Now, is it easier today or harder for someone who wants to make, let's say, a million-dollar bet? Well, well, first of all, uh, I haven't sought to go try to bet as much money as I can on a game, but I think there's a way you could probably do that. Uh you know, what's happened is, just like in Las Vegas, at one time we had 30 casino owners. Now we've got six people or six or eight entities that control the entire city. Anytime you, you've got a lack of competition, that's never good. So the same thing's kind of happened in the, uh, the sports betting industry. You've got a lot less places to bet. And it may sound good because you can bet all across the country, but it's still one place you're betting. If you bet them a significant amount of money, they're going to move the line. You can bet them one time. I haven't tried to put that together, but I'm confident probably if I did, I could. Uh, but I'm not sure of that. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's different than what it was. And, uh, and I, think, I think to a certain aspect it, it's better and there could be a certain thing it could be viewed to be worse. I don't know. I, I love the, some of the anecdotes. And uh, we, we have to go to the 2009 uh, Super Bowl. After we did all the analysis and what have you, I, I became convinced that, uh, you know, uh, well, we had a big point differential between the number we'd made and the number was out there. And uh, and I was going to make a big bet on the Arizona Cardinals. So, so instead of making the entire bet on, on the outcome of the game, I, I spread some of my risk and I made a big bet on the uh, halftime. And then, you know, it came down to the very end and I had my bet won. And, uh, uh, Arizona's on, on the goal line. They're getting ready to go in. I mean, they're like on the six-inch line. And, uh, I mean, there's a few seconds left to go in a half. I mean, a half's almost over. So, Kurt Warner, uh, he goes back and uh, attempts to pass in the end zone, and uh, James Harrison uh, intercepts it. And uh, big old burly line, linebacker. And he intercepts it in the end zone. And he's lumbering down through there, and I see Larry Fitzgerald. He's running, trying to catch him, and one of Larry's own players got in his way. And um, I told Sue, I said, here goes our pretty money. Anyway, uh, he lumbers in, he falls into the end zone. He's so exhausted. And, uh, and uh, out the door, my pretty money went. Now, you then made a score either the next year or the year after that with the New Orleans Saints of $3.5 million. Was that the biggest – that you ever won on a single bet, Billy, three and a half, or was there more? No, no, that was the biggest bet I ever won on a single bet. I, I, what had happened, uh, uh, the number came out, and I, I thought we'd either made a mistake. I said, this came, you know, we had a seven-point differential in the number. And uh, to have a seven-point differential in the number for the Super Bowl, I mean, the last game of the season, it's like unheard of. And because normally what happens as the season goes forward, the number the odds makers have and our number, normally they get closer. Okay, because you've got games have played and people have disseminated information and, uh, and the number usually gets closer. We got a seven point differential. And uh, so uh, it was just you know, an enormous difference in opinion. So I made a, an enormous bet. Well, another character that Billy Walters came in contact with actually played cards with him for a long time was a good friend for a while was uh, Steve Wynn but then Billy you decided that maybe somebody can get an edge in roulette this was back when I was a casino player and uh and when I drank and I lost large amounts of money in casinos at the time Golden Nugget had the best poker room in town so I played poker over there and I met Steve Wynn and uh Steve one day asked me said uh, why don't you play over here and uh 
course, I didn't want to play over there because the horseshoe had higher limits and, uh, and they had better odds. Uh, but anyway, I was drinking over there one night, and I started playing some uh, Baccarat, and I lost, I don't know, 50, 100,000 bucks. And then I was playing over there again. I got to play in some blackjack, and I lost some some more money. And, uh, well, about that same time, uh, some guys came to me, and they were looking for a, somebody to put up money to play roulette. And, you know, they, they laid this story on me, and uh, – uh, I thought it was a con, but it it, it 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 piqued my interest about roulette wheels. So I bought a roulette wheel and uh, disassembled it, and and I did realize that roulette wheels uh, were mechanical devices, and if they got old enough and they weren't maintained properly, they could create a potential bias. And if the bias were to be large enough, uh, you know, and you could identify it, you could turn it into your advantage, even with uh, the odds on a roulette. I would gather certain number of numbers on a roulette wheel. I'd run a little program, and if it appeared that there was a bias, I'd get a larger set of numbers and to confirm it, and uh, and then I would go play the roulette wheel. Well, I started playing roulette at the Golden Nugget in downtown Las Vegas. Steve went out a casino in Atlantic City, and uh, we made a game. I was going to go out and play roulette, and but I, I put up a million dollars, and the agreement was I, I, I got a $1,000 limit I could bet per number. So I flew to uh, Atlantic City with my wife and uh, posted a million dollars in a cage and uh, went over to the roulette wheel to play. And, uh, and the rules were different in Atlantic City than they were, than they were in Las Vegas. They, they couldn't uh, borrow one of the zeros. Roulette wheels have two zeros on them. And uh, the odds are killer if, you, if, if those two zeros, uh, uh, if you land on either one. But if they eliminate one of the zeros, the odds are still killer, but you got a much better chance. Well, they wouldn't borrow the zero, and and I wasn't going to play the roulette wheel with two zeros. Although I felt like I could beat it, I didn't want to wake them up that I could beat a roulette wheel with two zeros. So I went over and I sat down and uh, started drinking Corona beer. And next thing you know, I got I got drunk. So I ended up back over to the blackjack table, and I lost a million bucks playing blackjack. So I got up the next morning and uh, flew back to Las Vegas. Uh, Steve and I were playing golf uh, a few days later, and uh, Brings up Atlantic City, and uh, I go back to Atlantic City, and I put up $2 million this time, and I'm playing roulette, and uh, in the two days, I won $3.8 million. Well, Steve was pretty uh, upset about losing the $3.8 million. From that moment forward, uh, he and I, uh, we haven't been friends. Since that time, we've had a very strained relationship. Then I went to prison, and uh, because of the circumstances of my case, uh, I, and not only myself, but a number of other people, lawyers, were convinced I'd get a pardon, and even thought there was a possibility of getting a pardon before going to prison. And then uh, once I got into prison, uh, the people who were working on my behalf to get, a, uh, to get a pardon, I was told on three different occasions I was being pardoned. And then uh, what we learned uh, uh, in the last minute, I, two different sources uh, told me told us that the pardon was being blocked by Steve Wynn uh, because of the, of the relationship he had with uh, President Trump at the time. And uh, so that's my relationship with Steve Wynn. I can verify that Wynn and Trump have had a very close relationship over the years. In fact, Billy, uh, the reason why the casino up here is named Wynn is because of Trump. He was going to, Steve was going to put a fancy French name on it, and Trump came out and pointed at his complex over there and said, no, name it Win. Yeah. No, don't waste it. It's shorter, right. snappy. People will remember it. So, uh, that's good advice. But that's a heavy price to pay not to get the full pardon because you deserved it, my friend. Billy, I could talk to you for hours at a time. I, I, I have enjoyed this uh, so much, and I, and I want to I wanna pass along to everybody. Believe me, you know, I don't own stock in Barnes & Noble, so I, this is not a business thing. But I think you're going to love the book, The Gambler, okay? A Life at Risk. Billy Walters, thank you so much for thank, being with us. Thank friend. you, Brent. I really appreciate it.